everyone. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Rivera. I'm an associate professor of political science and public administration at SUNY Buffalo State. And it's my honor today to moderate the, our first plenary session, post-disaster longitudinal cohort studies across cultural contexts. Today we have five presentations. Um, before we start, I would like to go over some real quick ground rules. Um, as the presenters are, are, are talking about their, their research, if you would have any questions, please type them in the chat box and closer to the end of the presentations, we'll have a time for questions and answers. Um, before we start, um, I would just ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves um, and we'll go down in the same order as the, as the, as the agenda. So we'll start with David. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. Uh, I am David Abramson. I'm a clinical associate professor of social and behavioral sciences at New York University School of Global Public Health, and I direct the Center for Public Health Disaster Science. Thank you. Shig? Hi, my name is Shig Tatsuki. I'm a sociologist at Doshisha University and also the president of the Doshisha I Bosai or Inclusive Bosai Research Center. Thank you. Mary? I'm Mary Waters. I'm a sociology professor at Harvard and the interim director of the Harvard Population Center. Thank you. Elizabeth? Hi, Elizabeth Frankenberg, professor of sociology at UNC Chapel Hill and director of the Carolina Population Center. And Mark? Hey everybody, Mark Van Lanningham. I'm a sociologist at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Well, welcome. And without further ado, um, going with the mantra of staying on time, um, we'll start with David. Great, thank you so much. Let me just open up my slides. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, hosting this panel. I'm really honored to be uh, sharing the stage or the virtual stage with uh, my colleagues, uh, many of whom I have worked with for a number of years. Um, and I, I sort of, I wanna start by saying that the work that I'm talking about represents the efforts of many teams over many years. So it is not simply my work, but the work of many. So in disaster research, we are very accustomed to speaking about social frames, and we're accustomed to talking about the social and political forces that contextualize the event itself. And we're also pretty good at speaking about uh, social vulnerabilities. But what's harder for us to really wrap our head around is explaining who will recover, what recovery means, why some people recover and others do not, and why some people experience a positive life trajectory, even as a result or in light of uh, an event that has occurred to them, whereas others get bumped from that trajectory uh, and uh, have much worse outcomes. Uh, and in fact, tend to miss out on social and economic opportunities. Furthermore, we're still searching for some sort of a grand theory of uh, individual or population recovery, particularly in the long term. And the challenge for most of us in this field is that when we begin to think about adding time into the equation and as time extends and we look at recovery over a long period of time, there are so many different variables that are intervening. It's the intersection of human psychology and spirit and imagination along with household dynamics economic and social assets, community po politics, larger economic forces and markets, and webs of social networks and institutional support systems. So there are so many different things that could be related to where somebody ends up down the road. How can we begin to characterize and conceptualize long-term recovery? We all know, of course, that catastrophic events are rising and they demand policy solutions to help prevent or mitigate these disasters, 
as well as policy solutions to address these questions of long-term recovery. And so fundamentally, we have both a measurement problem and we have a conceptual problem. And so from the measurement perspective, more often than not, when we talk about recovery, it's, uh, or policymakers speak about recovery, it's in terms of brick and mortar or about tax revenues. Uh, it's harder for them to characterize what it means to say that the population has recovered. Uh, and as we've talked about, we have a conceptual challenge. We need this grand theory to help explain things. And so I'm going to focus now on uh, our study uh, in Katrina to walk through some of these measurement and conceptual challenges. And I'm gonna talk about the Gulf Coast Child and Family Health Study. Uh, many of you are entirely familiar with all this setup. Uh, it, uh, Katrina displaced one and a half million residents, an enormous displacement. It remains the largest uh, natural hazard uh, in recent US history. And when we began the Gulf Coast Child and Family Health Study, we had in mind to develop an observational cohort, cohort study that would be representative of displaced and impacted populations in Louisiana and Mississippi. It was designed to be relevant to policymakers with rapid uh, reporting. And we also had in mind that we wanted it to be available to us to expand and develop theoretical frameworks for public health disaster science. And so what we did was we conducted a multi-stage cluster sampling in both Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, we were using uh, uh, sampling frames built around congregate settings like FEMA trailer parks and hotels in Louisiana. And in Mississippi, we added to that uh, impacted census blocks. Uh, ultimately, we recruited 1,079 households within one year. And this sample is representative of between 60 to 100,000 displaced or heavily impacted Katrina survivors. Um, this is just a, uh, a quick look at uh, the different rounds of data collection that we did. We did five total beginning in 2006. Um, and at each round, uh, our retention rate varied between about 75% to 88%. And so there were two things that I really wanna focus on there the measurement issue and the conceptual issue. So the first measurement issue is how are we going to capture individual level change over time in a variety of domains, such as mental health, housing, economic stability, as well as subjective appraisals of recovery. And then in terms of the conceptual frame, we ended up um, relying upon the socio-ecological framework of disaster recovery. And essentially this is built first on a dose response model, that the more disaster exposure there is, the more there's going to be um, a disaster outcome or a long-term recovery outcome. And we began uh, looking at you know, these five domains of economic stability, housing stability, physical and mental well-being, and social role adaptation, meaning that uh, if your social identity or social role had been disrupted uh, as a result of the event, how likely are you to be able to adapt to that? Um, we added to this the mediators of formal health systems, uh, health and social service systems, which could mediate the effect of the disaster on the outcome. We thought about effect modifiers, and since this was an ecological model, and it's something that we developed uh, thinking about Uri Bronfenbrenner's ecological models, they're gonna operate at multiple levels, communal levels, household, individual levels. So you can have institutions in a community that may be helping to uh, lift, uh, lift up the, uh, the survivors. You can have uh, household level uh, functioning uh, and social support. And at an individual level, you can imagine the various psychological characteristics, self-efficacy, post-traumatic growth that could be uh, affecting the uh, intermediate between the exposure and the outcome. And then there are, of course, those things that existed before the event even occurred. There are chronic stressors and there are pre-event moderators. And all of this is happening within the realm of time. Important to us in public health was that we were also applying here a social determinants of health model. And one of the things that we have been thinking a lot about over the years is something called fundamental cause 
theory that uh, Bruce Lenk and Joe Phelan developed a number of years ago. And what that posits is that there are fundamental causes that exist sort of before all of these things. You can think about them in terms of somebody's access to knowledge, prestige, power, and capital. Um, and uh, these are things that could precede or are related to those chronic stressors and pre-event moderators. So now we move from the framework to testing it. And so I wanna show you uh, one way that we tested this framework. We've tested it a number of different ways over the years. And in fact, there'll be a number of other speakers at this conference who will be presenting different ways we picked out parts of this model. I'm gonna focus on time and the relationship between uh, uh, time and stable housing. And so here we're doing a survival analysis of how long it took the members of our 1,079 person cohort to achieve stable housing over a 13 year period. And what you see is when we look at a little bit of a subset, those for whom we didn't lose track, 884 respondents, 15% uh, were not displaced at all, 18% were displaced but received but achieved stable housing within 18 months, but then two thirds either achieved stable housing or never achieved stable housing uh, after 18 months. And it took up to 1,082 days or three years on average for people to achieve stable housing. That is a place they could live where they knew they wouldn't have to move for a year or more. And here I'm going to look at ways that we have sort of split the, these survival analyses by different characteristics in order to understand, are we beginning to see patterns? And so when we split it by race, we don't really see any difference in terms of time to stable housing. When we split it by the type of damage that the houses uh, incurred at the time of Katrina, we don't really see a significant difference in terms of time to stable housing. However, when we look at age, we begin to see a significant effect. There's essentially almost a 500 day penalty for those who are 18 to 34 at the time of the event compared to those who are 66. The red line in the middle being the median time to stable housing. When we look at homeowners versus renters, as you might, have mentioned, um, might imagine, the renters are those um, that have a penalty in terms of achieving stable housing. Similarly, those in poverty have a penalty of a 250 days uh, that takes them 250 days longer to achieve stable housing on average. And so we take all of these things together and these are from the, the Gulf Coast Child and Family Health Study. And there are two things that, that still are of interest to, to us. Number one, are these findings generalizable to other Katrina survivors? We recognize that our cohort was fairly unique in, its, in the way it was constructed um, as being a very displaced population. And are there fundamental causes that may lead to unstable housing. And so this leads us to some of my colleagues on the panel. Um, and together we created the Katrina at 10 project, which was funded by the NIH, uh, the National Institute for Child Health and Development. Uh, and what we did was we essentially pooled our resources to take three of our longitudinal cohorts and work this together. So we went back into the field at the same time between uh, 2017 and 2018, we asked the same questions um, and we were hoping to be able to begin to generalize our findings. And you can see, and you're gonna hear a lot more from both Mark and Mary about the Kativa Nola study, about the Vietnamese Americans and about the risk study uh, about low income parents. When we looked at comparing our three cohorts together, and I'm sorry that the uh, the data are uh, maybe hard to read, but the concept here may be pretty evident to most of you, which is the cohorts are dramatically different. So the age range of uh, the Gulf Coast study was you know, a, a broader distribution, whereas the, uh, the age range for uh, risk was much younger. There were gender differences, race, ethnicity differences, education, marital status differences, all of these highly different. When you look at marital status change, for example, you'll see that in GCAF, over half moved from a partnered to a non-partnered status. Uh, 
whereas in the Cativa Nola, 76% remain partnered. So you have very different cohorts. And when you look at what they said and where they were at the, the moment that we interviewed them in 2017 uh, or 18, you could see, first of all, the retention rates are about uh, equivalent across the three cohorts. Uh, in terms of their mental health, uh, the risk and GCAF cohorts are very similar, whereas the Vietnamese cohort, far better. When we ask people uh, as part of um, uh, a flourishing scale, do you lead a meaningful and purposeful life? You could see dramatically different, as well as subjective recovery. Uh, and so we take all of this together and we try to apply this and see, okay, can we, can we at least ask this question about time to stable housing. And so I've grayed out those pieces that we did not put into this immediate test. Uh, and in part, it's because we don't always have uh, common data elements, which is one of the problems. So we, we tested it across all, and this is putting all the cohorts together. And now the only things that emerged from it were that those who had any college were faster to get into stable housing and those that had larger families were quicker to get mm -hmm. into stable housing. And so we've lost a little bit of the, um, the findings that we had in GCAP alone. Perhaps these may be more durable across different populations. And so taking all that together, it sort of, uh, it led us to, to consider, and we've been looking at subjective and objective measures of recovery. They're quite distinct. I'm not gonna go into them now, but the two challenges that we have remaining are, testing and validating our recovery measures. Is it you know, time to housing? Is it change in mental health? Is it economic stability? Is it housing stability? Is it all of these things together? And harmonizing measures across data sets in which the, these uh, effects were collected uh, in different fashion. And conceptually, we're still working through these questions of, is there a difference between being made whole, that is you're back to where you were, or bouncing forward and you're better? Have we begun to validate some latent construct of recovery? We were able to do that with just GCAF. Can we do that with a broader construct? construct? And then lastly, and most importantly, have we begun to identify the causes and determinants of recovery sensitive to policy adjustments? Um, there's, there's so much to, to talk about policy implications. I'm gonna hold off on that for now and, uh, and maybe pick up on that uh, during the Q&A. So with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back to Jason. Thank you, David. Um, next up, we'd like to hear from Shay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we okay. can. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shin Tatsuki, and I'll share with you the research result from the 1995 Kobe earthquake and from the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake recovery studies. The key point of my research is that there are pre-existing inequalities and post-disaster social environmental changes that make longitudinal impact upon both subjective and objective measures of individual and collective recovery. A brand new concept of life recovery was coined after the 1995 Kobe earthquake and many so-called life recovery policies and programs were executed. It was in the summer of 1999 when a, a social psychologist Haruo Hayashi and I were asked by Kobe City to conduct the assessment of the progress of life recovery programs. Due to a lack of preceding studies, we decided to conduct community-based participatory research. 12 grassroots brainstorming type of assessment workshops were held and about 240 survivors participated. In the end, 1,623 opinion cards uh, on a POSIC note uh, on life recovery were collected and they were grouped according to the affinity. Eventually, seven mutually exclusive super categories emerged. <clears throat> we named this 
the seven critical element model of life recovery. Among the seven elements, the first two, housing and social ties, accounted for more than a half of all opinion cards. The same style of workshops were held before the earthquake 10th year anniversary. At this time, no one mentioned housing to be important. The top most mentioned categories were social ties and community outlook. By the fall of 1999, we have developed life recovery constructs and corresponding scales. And prior to the workshop, the 1999 pilot life recovery survey was conducted. This survey produced a reliable and unidimensional 14 item life recovery scale. Using the original seven critical elements and life recovery scales, we launched the 2001, three, five Hyogo life recovery surveys. Hyogo life recovery surveys consist of two samples, one cross-sectional and the other panel samples, as you can see. I will show the result from the complete panel data set of N being 297. All 20, 297 trajectories of life recovery scores on three waves were drawn on the left graph. Cluster analysis of these trajectories produced four simple patterns of life recovery. This revealed that the respondents were classified into four stable patterns from very high, mid medium high, medium low, and very low. The last very low group consisted of consisted of 65 individuals whose life recovery scores averages appeared to be stable, especially from 2003 to 2005. However, this does not mean that there were no variabilities within this group. These three graphs illustrate within group variabilities in the very low recovery group. The left graph shows that those who were relocated more than four times were characterized by a steady decline. On the other hand, those whose relocations were under three exhibited a life recovery bouncing back from 2003 to 2005. In a middle graph, the similar bouncing back was observed only among those who often or sometimes participated in community events. And those who said that they seldomly participated showed a steady decline. The left and middle graph support the notion that personal or egocentric social ties mattered in one's sense of life recovery. The right graph shows the power of collective slash community social ties. Only those who re resided in a neighborhood where everybody was sociable and was involved in neighborhood event showed a clear bouncing back from 2003 to 2005. Now I would like to move on to the 2011 Great East Japan Earthquake Life Recovery Survey results. The data were collected in the city of Natori, just south of Sendai City. GEJ Natori panel surveys conducted in five waves uh, consist of 347 respondents. Among them, 316 individuals completed all measures on five occasions. Like the Hyogo panel surveys, the 316 complete response individuals responded to the life recovery scale on five occasions, and their trajectories were drawn on the left graph. Like the Hyogo study, these 316 trajectories of life recovery scores were cluster analyzed, and this time we, uh, six clusters were extracted. Like the Hyogo study, we focused on those who are very low in early waves. The red-lined group remained very low during all five waves of survey, while the purple-lined group showed a bouncing back from 2017 to 2020. What were the characteristics of the red and purple groups? Regarding sociodemographic variables, both groups were characterized as male, 
and over the age of 50. Some job categories were similar. Both groups were typically retired, unemployed, or pensioner. However, some differences existed between the two groups. The purple or bouncing back group enjoyed family life with more than three members. Some of them typically relied on salaried income. On the contrary, the red or very low life recovery group was characterized as having one or only two family members, being the head of a household and or being small business owners. The last point reminds us of Dan Alish and his associates work on long-term community and especially small business recovery. With regard to post-event social environmental changes, the bouncing back group enjoyed rich personal social ties in terms of kith and kin, as well as a number of other acquaintances through hobby and or interest circles, which may be described as weak social ties. The purple group was also typified as residing in a high collective or community social tie neighborhood. On the contrary, one of the major social environmental changes within the red line group was a shift from rich pre-disaster to poor post-disaster person social ties. Based on the summarized qualitative understandings of the impact of critical element on life recovery, panel data analysis were conducted. We entered the seven critical element variables to fixed effect model equations and found the five variables were significant predictors of life recovery with an R squared of 31.6%. The enlarged table show that housing and physical mental health and livelihood significantly predicted uh, life recovery. Moreover, community and personal social ties were also very good predictors of life re recovery. Among the social ties, among the social tie variables, we can conclude that on one hand, that the community social ties with soci which sociologists like Duquesne called solidarity, Boudou cultural capital, Jacobs Coleman Putnam social capital, and on the other hand, the strengths of weak personal ties coined by Granovetta were two strongest predictors of life recovery. So far, I have been summarizing the subjective measures of life recovery. Now let us start looking at objective measure results. These two graphs show Kaplan-Meier survival analysis curves of housing recovery. The rate of housing recovery is simply what is left after subtracting temporary housing occupancy rate from one. The left graph shows housing recovery curves by household size in Natori city, while the right illustrates those in Sendai city. Both graphs support the idea that family size mattered in housing recovery, a subset concept of life recovery. However, we observe striking differences in the two city results. The left or natural curves are characterized by large between group variabilities, while the right or Sendai curves exhibited very small variabilities. Similar between group variability differences were observed in terms of gender of household head in Natori and Sendai. What were the determinant of household size and gender gaps? If you close look at the Sendai curb, the gender gap shrunk in two occasions, April of 2014 and April of 2016. These two months coincided with Sendai City introduction of disaster case management phase one and phase two, where two being more aggressive, two specially targeted struggling survivors. In order to test our hypotheses, we then turned our attentions to aggregate month-to-month -month temporary housing occupancy data, which had been decoded by Miyagi Prefecture. 
The figure shows the temporary housing occupancy by time in the 14 affected cities and towns uh, with the red curves. The first difference of housing recovery velocity uh, with the blue curve and the public housing completion rate by time with green curve. Here we note that Sendai city has two blue, blue line peaks of household recovery, while uh, Ishinomaki city has a stable rate and Tagajo and Shiogama cities showed only one major peak in blue curves. What is commonly observed in all four cities is that the velocity, velocity and or acceleration of housing recovery coincided with public housing unit uh, provisions. However, Sendai shows two peaks. What caused the second peak? Our hypotheses are as follows. The second peak can be accounted for by disaster case management, which was implemented only in Sendai city and provided face-to-face -face support for survivors to move into public housing unit. To examine this hypothesis, we used a causal inferencing technique called synthetic control method to determine the effect of the intervention. The figure shows the time on the horizontal axis and the temporary housing occupancy rate on the vertical axis. The solid line shows the decline curve of the temporary housing occupancy rate uh, in the actual Sendai city. And the dotted line shows the decline curve of the synthetic controlled Sendai city. Counterfactual Sendai city was calculated from comparable Ishinomaki, Shiogama, and uh, Tagajo data. Now conclusions. Age, household size, gender, and job predicted post-disaster re life recovery patterns. Improvement in community and personal social ties were associated with, oops, I have to shut up. Let me just <laughs> finish up the summary. Uh, improved uh, community and personal social ties were associated with bouncing back even among the most disadvantaged group. In addition to housing stress, housing stress and livelihood recovery, community social ties and strengths of personal weak ties are important predictors of life recovery. Disaster case management alleviated housing recovery gaps among different demographic and socioeconomic groups. Both wholesale, i.e. public housing, and retail, i.e. disaster case man management method, facilitate faster, equitable, and thus effective life recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Shape. Um, now we'll hear from Mary. All right, uh, thank you. I have to, here we go. All right. Uh, Okay, can you guys see my slides? Yes. All right, great, thank you. Yes, so can. I'm gonna talk about the risk project, which David briefly uh, introduced. And I wanna thank everyone for having me here to this uh, workshop and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. So uh, I am uh, gonna talk about a work that is very much the result of a collaboration. I have listed just some of our major uh, collaborators here, but we have a, a very strong and wonderful team of faculty, postdocs, and graduate students working on this project with me. And we've been working on it for a long time. So um, I also want to do a shout out to all of the funders who have uh, funded the project uh, over the years. So um, the Resilience of Survivors of Katrina study started in 2004 as a study of what could keep community college students in school. So it recruited um, uh, a little over a thousand um, single parents uh, who were attending um, New Orleans area uh, community colleges. And um, it was part of a nationwide study <clears throat> And the people who were conducting the study, I was just a kind of uh, person who was looking on, abandoned it after Katrina, but they had already done 
baseline and they were in the field doing a follow-up study when the, um, the storm hit. So uh, I didn't know much about disasters, but I knew we had a gold mine of information on people and that we should keep studying them. So the sample um, was young adults between the ages of 18 to 34. Their family income was less than 200% of the poverty level, and uh, they were the parent of at least one child under the age of 19. So they were not the poorest of the poor, but they were poor single parents, almost all of them poor single mothers, and they were predominantly um, African-American. Uh, they were receiving government benefits. Um, the average age of their children was three years and a disproportionate number, uh, almost half, came from the Ninth Ward. Um, and so we had variation in the effect of the storm on um, uh, and the flooding on people, but uh, we had people who had been very deeply affected. So we went back, uh, so there was baseline survey and then they were in the middle of a 12 month follow-up and had reached half the sample when they had to stop. This, uh, the disaster hit and we have interviewed people three times uh, since then. Um, uh, and the last time as part of the PO1 project with um, uh, David Abramson and Mark Van Lanningham who have their own um, uh, uh, cohorts. So uh, we have reached 92% of the people uh, at, at least once since baseline um, and uh, uh, have worked very hard to keep up uh, the, the survey. So uh, we have many uh, measures in the risk data. I won't go into all of them. Uh, the measures of exposure to Katrina included home da damage, bereavement, uh, a Katrina-related trauma score, and flooding both uh, objective because we had their addresses and subjective uh, accounts of flooding. We also have a number of measures of mental health before the storm and at every point since then. Uh, Post-traumatic uh, stress we did not have before the storm, but psychological distress, uh, the K-6, and uh, we did have before the, before the um, disaster. So the advantages of the risk data are that we had the pre-disaster data. We had asked all kinds of questions like access to a car, social support, trust in government, personality variables, socioeconomic variables, you name it, uh, and a lot of data on physical and mental health. Um, we have longitudinal data that allows us to differentiate the recovery of the people from the recovery of the place which I think is very important in looking at disasters. We follow a vulnerable population and our, um, our study is both uh, multi-method because we have qualitative interviews as well as the survey and interdisciplinary. We have a team that included uh, economists, psychologists, sociologists, uh, urban planners. Um, I'm forgetting something, but uh, we had a lot of different social scientists working on this. So today I wanna to just talk about two questions that have kind of haunted us from the beginning that we're trying to answer with these, uh, this latest wave of data. The first is what pre-disaster variables affect long-term recovery? Basically, what advantage do we have from having the pre-disaster data, which is so rare in disasters, and uh, what, what can we um, uh, say about who um, is most at risk for long-term problems or who is better suited for long-term recovery? And secondly, the question that um, I think people ask themselves after a disaster and that we are certainly asked by, um, by others uh, in terms of what our, our study shows, which is, should I stay or should I go? Should you rebuild or should you uh, move away from uh, uh, the place where the disaster occurred? So we know a lot about the trajectories of recovery in terms, we know the most about psychological impacts of major disasters, my, my reading of the, of the research is. Um, and we also uh, have had a lot of recent research in the field on economic recovery. Um, but what we were interested in was how do different domains of life change in recovery? Are there trade-offs to be made between economic, social, and psychological recovery? And what we did was a latent class analysis model based on David Abramson's uh, theoretical model of recovery. 
so this is uh, David's one of David's models, um, and he uh, posits that these um, elements are important for uh, measure for a, a, a proper recovery from a disaster. And so those are the variables that we tried to look at. We um, basically spent a lot of time trying to figure out statistically how to do this. We were trying in 2007. And we kept being told by various statisticians that we couldn't put everything into our, um, we were running things that were going for like two nights and they were saying, no, you couldn't do this. It was taking up all the computer um, uh, power. Uh, but luckily uh, things have changed and a 2016 study, uh, 2016 um, uh, paper on group-based multi-trajectory modeling uh, gave us the method that we used. We measured recovery by self-rated health, mental health, income, social support, number of moves, or, or stable housing, and uh, poverty. And so uh, we um, did a latent class analysis. We uh, found three groups um, and uh, uh, looked at kind of what determined uh, what the groups looked like and then what determined membership in the groups. So group one was uh, the majority of our respondents, about 66%, they had a modest recovery. Their health is getting slightly worse as they age. Their mental health um, uh, got better after a spike um, uh, after Katrina. Their income's going up modestly. Their social support is steady and better than um, uh, some of the other groups. Uh, their moves were very high after the storm, then more stable, and their poverty at the tract level is going down. The group two, which is our smallest group, is about 7%, and they are the group that is uh, thriving and bouncing back better. Their health is slightly worse as they age, but better than group three. Their mental health has always been good. Their income's much higher. Their moves after the storm, uh, they had moves after the storm and then became stable. Uh, their census tract poverty is low and stays low. Group three was the worst off. It's a little bit more than a quarter of our sample. Their health starts worse before, um, uh, and, and then it, uh, it, it worsens over time. Their mental health is, um, is, is not good and stays um, uh, not good. Their income is low and not rising. Their social support is low and falls over time. They have more moves, less stable housing, and their poverty rate is higher and stays higher. So we looked at whether these groups match um, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, subjective recovery. And you can see that um, in some ways they do. 0% um, of our, our thriving group says their situation is worth, worse. Our um, worst off group, 23% say their, their um, situation is worse. And they are also the most likely to say that they still think of themselves as a disaster victim. So what determines membership in uh, the trajectories using our pre-disaster data? So we ran three models. The first um, included baseline characteristics that are not in the trajectory. The second added health measures, pre-disaster health measures. And the third added um, hurricane exp experiences, the number of traumas, water depth, and whether or not they were bereaved. And what we find is um, uh, that th this is uh, the model, but I'll just skip ahead to the findings. Um, whoops. Oh, I had the findings. Um, what what um, predicted uh, being in the thriving group versus the modest uh, recovery, uh, being white or Hispanic, being married and having better self-rated health before the storm? What predicted the odds of being in the worst off versus the modest, being on food stamps at baseline, having less social support and having um, worse mental health? Um, the hurricane experiences do not predict uh, uh, the longitudinal outcomes. They certainly predicted things in our first two surveys, but they are not predicting this overall longitudinal trajectory. Uh, here are some quotes. Um, I, I think I'll just give you the quote from um, the person who uh, is in the worst um, uh, uh, trajectory, the downward trajectory. Uh, she was describing um, what it was like for her after the hurricane. She said, I was trying to be strong for my kids. I had to be strong and let them know that everything's going to be okay. 
And the interviewer said, did you get some medicine and did that help? And she's gonna say this, the medicine was helpful because I would have periods of outbursts of crying. It helped with that. However, the overall situation, it doesn't help with, and I'm gonna tell you why. If my, my reality is what it is, there's no amount of medicine that can change my reality. So if I know the reality I'm going to face every day, what will the medicine actually really do? Um, so uh, I want to briefly just say something about the location of our respondents, which is the second question, should I stay or should I go? Um, in 2006, uh, in the six months to a year after the disaster, only 7% were back in their pre-Katrina pre census tract. By 2010, 23% were back. Um, and by the la latest um, uh, survey, 70% of the sample were back in Louisiana, 45% were back in New Orleans or in Jefferson counties. The remainder were in 22 U.S. states. So they still are, um, and at one point they were in 37 states. So they really uh, spread out across the U.S. This is one year after the disaster. This is FEMA uh, data on where people were after the disaster. This is 2009-2010, um, uh, and this is back in 2018. So the standard approach to measuring neighborhood effects is to look at um, uh, census and other data, um, that standard uh, definition of neighborhood quality, like percent in poverty, segregation, uh, low income, home ownership, unemployment, et cetera. And we've published a paper uh, based on that, by, uh, led by Karina Graff, um, showing that people who moved long distance and people who had worse flooding um, had much lower poverty rates and less segregation and less dis disadvantage uh, after the hurricane. People were, were uh, moved to neighborhoods that were better. Um, so in this more recent study, uh, Shin Bin Tan, Mariana Arkaya, and I are working on a paper in which we take the opportunity scores that Chetty and Hendren uh, have developed, uh, looking at um, uh, children growing up in households and what kind of opportunity neighborhoods give to them. Did I just get a ding that I'm out of time? Yes? Yes, okay, um, let me just get to the punchline then. So we used the Chetty and Hendren opportunity scores and what we found was that um, it did have an effect um, and that uh, looking at a weighted duration of people in neighborhoods by opportunity scores actually uh, predicted their income and moving to a higher opportunity neighborhood uh, raised your income uh, over time. Um, and it was significantly beneficial to people uh, moving out of New Orleans, uh, and uh, they were better off economically, but there was no change in their health. Um, uh, it didn't improve their mental health. So I just want to end by saying that um, uh, the question of whether and when disasters act as poverty traps versus shocks that push people into better economic trajectories than they would otherwise have is an important one. And I think we really need to focus down on the question of whether or not um, disasters may be chances for people to move to better opportunities and we could take advantage of that. And finally, risk also tells us that pre-existing um, uh, poverty and health conditions uh, uh, really affect long-term outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, up next, we have Elizabeth. Hi. Uh, Hello. Let me share my screen. Okay, everybody seeing slides? Great. Yes, we are. Okay, terrific. Thanks. Well, this it's a great pleasure to be here and be with this group. Um, this is such a fascinating set of studies. Um, I'm going to talk about the same topic, long-term dynamics of health and well-being uh, after a disaster. And, um, sorry, just a sec. <laughs> 
So, you know, one of the topics that we've already heard about is that disasters can change communities, and that often happens suddenly. Uh, this is Aceh, Indonesia, shortly after the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004. This next slide is a picture of Mexico Beach, Florida, after Hurricane Michael in 2018. And, you know, in both instances, we see the amazing destruction of, in one case, water sweeping ashore, and in another case, combination of storm surge and very high winds. So, you know, a fundamental question is what are the impacts on population? And I think there's a variety of ways to think about uh, the potential uh, variation in those impacts. Um, you know, one important thing is, is that these events have the potential to create large death tolls, either immediately or over time. And we know something about what mortality is typically at the time of the event, less so about how mortality evolves in the aftermath of such an event. Um, they also, of course, create extremely stressful experiences among survivors, uh, and people have to develop short and longer term plans in a climate of great uncertainty. And that's, um, you know, potentially quite difficult, but, you know, a, a complicated planning exercise. Um, communities may or may not return to their pre-disaster levels of population and infrastructure. That's a big unknown. And large scale disasters, you know, have the impact or have the potential to affect uh, sort of both the regional and potentially the national equilibrium. So I think another important component of thinking about impacts on populations is the extent to which a particular disaster, you know, is, is, a, is a smaller scale event affecting one or several communities versus something that's really occurring at the regional or national scale. You know, there's a critical need for population processes and outcomes linked to measures of community level change in the environment. And a lot of what this panel has been talking about is trying to put those two types of data together. Um, censuses and surveys are very commonly the sources of data on population, but what about data on community level impacts? You know, I think that's something that's critical, but often, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really from a different set of disciplinary perspectives often. Um, you know, one of the things that we're starting to look at is predictions of vulnerability based on models from hydrology, oceanography, meteorology, and engineering. And so those sorts of uh, physical science models can give us really, I think, new measures of how communities have been affected. Um, there are also in the moment measures, high water marks and wind gauges, direct observation, and when you're doing surveys, those can be a really important component of how you measure impact on the community. And then finally, inferences from satellite imagery. And, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about how technology has changed our ability to measure things. So the event that I'm going to talk about is uh, the 2004 Sumatran Andaman earthquake and Indian Ocean tsunami. And this occurred on December 26th. I'm going to try to make my mouse show you uh, sort of where this occurred. Um, let's see. So the epicenter was here off the coast of Indonesia. There was a 1,200 kilometer unzipping of the ocean floor, and that generated a series of waves that moved um, across the ocean, slamming into the coast of Indonesia within about 15 minutes, also Thailand, and then moving across the Indian Ocean all the way to the, uh, the shores of Africa. Um, this was an, a, a really powerful uh, event. Um, it moved the North Pole, uh, impact, there was impact on water movement measured in every ocean. And the site that I'm going to focus on is Aceh, Indonesia, which is over here. Uh, that was sort of ground zero in some sense with um, around 200,000 people killed and another uh, 750,000 displaced. The population of that province is about 4 million. So this was a really high mortality event uh, with a good bit of variation across communities and how things were in uh, what the levels of impacts were. Oops. So one of the things that um, you know, we've done a lot with in this project is to use high resolution satellite imagery to capture change in communities. Um, this is a community on that west coast before the tsunami, 
uh, it's a beautiful place with, with beaches and also roads, houses, aquaculture. These are aquaculture ponds up here and uh, a variety of crops. This is um, before the tsunami. This is about two weeks uh, after the tsunami. Uh, the water has rushed ashore and changed the land cover from uh, this idyllic scenery on the left to bare earth uh, and removed um, houses, roads, bridges, infrastructure, crops. So there was an enormous impact in the places that were really uh, strongly affected. But you know, one of the things you see from this is there was also a high degree of local variation and impact. So slightly higher areas were less affected, trees remain, but the water rushed inland in the low lying areas along the river basin and destroyed um, you know, even areas further from the coast. Uh, so this is you know, showing you a uh, variation in, in impact as a function of, of elevation, but there were also local idiosyncrasies as a function of sort of direction of the, of the, of the land relative to um, the, the shape of the coastline relative to the waves coming ashore. Um, you know, a really important part of this project has been trying to look at the role of assistance and enormous amount of assistance was pledged to help Indonesia try to recover from this in this particular province. So $7 billion was pledged um, for a recovery project that took place over the next seven years from 2005 to 2012. And this next image is gonna show you the same village five years later. Uh, and what you see is is the recovery process. So the road has been rebuilt. That was actually a, a road that was paid for by USAID. Houses are back again. Um, some crops, the beach actually as a function of geological processes has, has, has added sand back. Um, one thing that isn't the same is that these areas that were aquaculture before are not aquaculture any longer. That's a highly capital intensive economy. And in addition, the tsunami waves kind of scoured out that water and made it too deep. But there's sort of a remarkable um, level of recovery in terms of how much this village five years later looked like it did before relative to this kind of unbelievable picture of just after the tsunami. So the project that we've been involved with since 2005 is the study of the tsunami aftermath and recovery or STAR. And like the other projects, it's a longitudinal survey of individuals, families, and communities before and after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. We actually started with a baseline that was collected by the Indonesian government in 2004. Um, and we identified 26,000 individuals between the ages of zero and 80 who were participants in that pre-tsunami baseline. And then we've worked to track them over time. Um, we conducted five annual surveys in the first five years, a 10-year survey at 2014-15, and an enhanced biomarker and cognition survey in 2016-17. That was 13 years after the tsunami. 96% um, of survivors have been interviewed at least once, and this is a multi-purpose survey. Uh, we do measure a lot in the form of biomarkers, height, weight, blood pressure, um, measures in this enhanced biomarker study of, of C-reactive protein um, and some other uh, point of care measurements. And then we cover um, a number of different survey domains in terms of uh, household composition, economics, work, fertility, uh, what you experience at the time of the tsunami, and then also loneliness and, and social support. So it's a multi-purpose study that's going to let us look at uh, impacts of the tsunami over time. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is this disaster and uh, impacts on mortality, psychosocial health, and socioeconomic status, a little bit about the role of assistance program, and then come back to the persistence of impacts. I'll focus mostly on medium and longer term impacts, but first I'm going to tell you something about mortality at the time of the tsunami. And in many of the graphs that follow, what I'll be doing is making a comparison between individuals who at the time of the tsunami were living in communities that were very badly affected by the waves. We know that from satellite imagery and from their geophysical locations. And I'll be comparing outcomes for those people living at the time of the tsunami in heavily damaged areas versus our comparison communities, which were not directly affected by the waves. So let's start with mortality at the time of the tsunami. 
And this graph is going to uh, show uh, mortality levels for the groups uh, who, at the time of the tsunami, were in areas that weren't really badly affected, low levels of mortality rising with age. This is mortality for individuals from the most affected areas. And um, on average, about 30% of individuals in those villages were killed at the time of the tsunami. But there are differential levels of mortality by age and by sex with um, the young, the older groups, more vulnerable, and women typically more vulnerable than men. So one of the things we can do then is take our longitudinal data from 10 years later and say, okay, conditional on surviving the tsunami, what happens to mortality risks in the next 10 years? And we're going to look at that at sort of a community level. So we're going to look at levels of, of um, of mortality in the next five, next 10 years among those who survived the tsunami arrayed by the percentage of community members who were killed during the event. And what we see there is actually a downward sloping line. The higher the percentage who died in the tsunami, the lower the mortality rates in the period uh, in the 10 years after the tsunami among those survivors. Um, so this is, you know, indicative of kind of a positive selection story where the communities that lost people tended to lose the more frail, leaving those who remained at, um, you know, at a survival advantage relative to these other communities. Okay, so that's, you know, this first set of results on mortality. Um, this next graph shows you psychosocial health, levels of post-traumatic stress reactivity. Those fell, those were elevated uh, in the first survey in 2005, right after the tsunami, more so in the heavy damage areas than in other areas. But uh, post-traumatic stress symptomatology declines in both of those areas. And by 2008 or so, they are not distinguishable anymore. So there is recovery in both areas, but a faster pace of recovery in the heavy damage areas for bringing those people back to the same levels. We also look and try to understand economic recovery, and we do that in a number of ways, but one of the ones that I like is a question that involves a six-step ladder, where we ask people to imagine a ladder with the richest at the top and the poorest at the bottom. We ask them at what position on this ladder they are today and where they were just before the tsunami. And we do that in each of these annual surveys and then in the later surveys as well. You know, and what we see there is that you get, not terribly surprisingly, a real big step down on that ladder uh, just after the tsunami among those from heavily damaged areas, not that same impact for those from the relatively unaffected areas. But there's a pretty quick return to, to something near baseline conditions by about 2007, and then trajectories continue upward, although at a slower pace for those from heavily damaged areas than from the unaffected areas. Uh, effects are similar for income and spending, which we also measure in the survey. So another point I want to make is the importance of assistance. Seven billion dollars of assistance flowed into this region over eight years. Humanitarian efforts and rebuilding of homes and infrastructure occurred, and there was a gradual restoration to places that looked normal. This was our starting slide right after the tsunami. This is about nine months after the tsunami, a different site. Um, vegetation is starting to come back, but it's still a field of rubble. And But gradually, uh, these um, assistance houses were built Built about 140,000 over the over the five years, and places start to look like communities again. Um, we've looked at uh, who received housing assistance. So about 21% of our respondents overall did, but that's really that's up to 80% of those whose homes were destroyed. Uh, receipt was actually less likely for those with more resources before the disaster. So there wasn't this kind of capture of these housing resources by the people who were the best off before. Um, among those received a home, we look at post-traumatic stress reactivity, and we can, just among the subset that got a home, track uh, a significant decline after receipt of that home, drawing on sort of variation on the timing of the receipt. Who got a home is not randomly distributed, but the timing of that receipt is much more likely to be randomly distributed. Um, and that effect is concentrated among those whose home was destroyed. Um, you know, one of the things that we see is the importance of levels of post-traumatic stress reactivity for sort of longer term health outcomes. Five years after the tsunami, we can look at children who were in utero at the time of the tsunami. Five years later, those guys are short relative to their peers. 
if their moms had high levels of PTSR in the two years after the disaster. The ones whose moms did not have those high levels of PTSR actually recover and more than recover in terms of height deficits. We find looking, going back to mortality for a second, that men over 50 at the time of the tsunami um, who had, had high levels of PTSR are at substantially elevated risk of death in the, in the next 10 years, given that they survived the tsunami itself. So while the overall effect was sort of positive mortality selection for certain subgroups, these men who had high levels of PTSR, the effect of that PTSR is to raise uh, uh, risk of death in the next 10 years. Um, we also look at levels of, of cortisol as measured in hair and show that uh, 15 years after the event, um, women who were exposed to the tsunami have evidence, show evidence of dysregulation of the hy hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So there are sort of long-term fingerprints that particularly come through for those who experienced high levels of PTSR in the two years after the tsunami. Um, I'm gonna conclude with just a couple of quick points about technology. Uh, you know, one is that this high resolution satellite imagery that captures changes over time is, is a really uh, innovative way to try to measure change over time and what these communities are like. And improvements in machine learning are making that processing and coding much more efficient. Um, this is our effort just for the city of Banda Aceh to you teach a computer to code high resolution imagery. And you know, what you see briefly in this is the, you know, the presence of yellow buildings before the tsunami, the change and the increase in blue water and decrease in these yellow buildings afterwards. But four years after the tsunami, this amazing amount of rebuilding that we're, we're capturing in this high resolution imagery. Um, Excuse and, me, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, because of time, could um, you provide the concluding remarks, please? Uh, absolutely. Okay. This is our van that we measured health. So 15 years later, we know a fair amount about the evolution of health and well-being. Data on long-term outcomes has been really important for modeling, projecting future impacts, and technology is making measurement easier, more effective. But, you know, I think this project and the others we've talked about, uh, are going to take continued investment and sort of deep commitment to interdisciplinary team science. So let me stop there. Um, gratefully acknowledged funding as well as the many collaborators who've been part of this. Thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. It was great. And finally, um, Mark. Has that first um, slide look, Jason? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna um, finish up the session talking about one of the cohorts that David briefly introduced in his opening remarks. This is the Vietnamese cohort. Um, I had um, been studying this particular community in, in New Orleans for a number of years before uh, Katrina hit and then was able to use some of the, um, some of the data that I collected for other reasons before Katrina to, to kind of follow them and track their recovery after time in a similar way that both Mary and Elizabeth did where they kind of repurposed on some other, some other studies. <clears throat> so what, what I'm gonna do in the 14 minutes or so that I have is I'm first going to, to come clean about what I mean by some of those terms in my um, title. I'm gonna briefly talk about how the Vietnamese fared compared to other groups who were similarly, similarly affected by Katrina. Um, but mostly I'm going to be talking about why that is. The short answer to that earlier question is they, they did much better than I expected and I think that anybody else would have expected kind of giving their attributes, you know, before the disaster happened. And then I'll wrap up with a few summaries and takeaways. <clears throat> okay, so Kativa Nola is this uh, kind of repurposed study of what used to be a uh, uh, study of immigration and health, where it was a binational study looking at Vietnamese who had moved to the U.S. in, in New Orleans and uh, comparing health outcomes with their counterparts back in Vietnam who wanted to come but weren't able to, um, to do so. So it's Katrina impacts on Vietnamese Americans in New Orleans. <clears throat> so it started off as um, um, this immigration study and then we'd finished the data collection just a few weeks before Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005 and I hope Rebecca Clark is still on the call. I had many long um, discussions with her about what some opportunities might be to kind of follow 
the, these immigrants who had been interviewed for other purposes uh, to, to track the recovery over time. Uh, she introduced me to, to Mary, who for, of course I had read you know, for years, but had never, um, uh, never had the pleasure of meeting her. Two of us quickly realized that David Ab Abramson was also doing some wonderful work um, related to Katrina, reached out to Narayan Sastry and Beth Fussell, who were interested in some of the kind of broader um, demographic changes. And all of a sudden we have a convoy, you know, we have this um, group of, 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 of studies, you know, moving, moving forward. Um, and, um, you know, really happy to kind of be able to tell you about some of those in the session today, in particular the Vietnamese um, sample here. Um, by history, what I um, have in mind is not just the objective facts of what happens related to Katrina, but also, you know, some other kind of prior historical events that affected some of the communities that, that were affected by Katrina, but also how those historical facts are kind of processed and interpreted by these communities that are, uh, that are affected. Uh, closely related to that, culture kind of derives from history and most social scientists, you know, focus on beliefs and kind of shared understandings. Here, I'm, I'm especially interested in how the community kind of um, leverages historical events to help them define who they are and what they're about, and also get to make meaning out of you know, the recovery as they kind of move forward after a, a, a big traumatic event like, um, like Katrina. Power, I'm interested in the distribution of resources and some of the processes that underlie that. Resilience, I, I'm, here I'm interested in community resilience and been very influenced by the work of Fran Norris, uh, who I you know, quote almost verbatim here, Susan Cutter, you know, who um, see resilience as a package of attributes that's going to set a community up to fare well or not so well, you know, as, as time moves um, forward after experiencing a traumatic event. And by post-disaster recovery, usually I just said what David said. Um, he, he actually did just say it, you know, earlier in the in, in the in the session. So I'm I'm following pretty closely his five dimensions of of recovery that he, he uh, talked about already: housing stability, mental and physical health, um, economic stability, and social role adaptation. So in terms of how the Vietnamese fared compared to their neighbors who weren't Vietnamese, you know, but you know, experienced the same flooding, wind, and other disruptions that um, you know, Katrina you know, brought to them, the answer is they did um, much better than expected. And I don't have time to kind of walk you through all the results of that. There's a long list of empirical papers in my last slide um, that you're welcome to um, read and argue with me about, um, you know, as you like. None of them are perfect, but they all kind of end up in the same direction, where, you know, using the best data available, um, the Vietnamese tend to do much better than similarly affected groups on all of those outcomes. Here's an example of return to stable, stable housing. So the, the blue line are the Vietnamese, and they can come back, you know, the most quickly, those would, be, would have been the white residents, but they were kind of like the ever ready bunny, you know, where they just kind of kept on, kept on, kept on coming at a very steady pace to where almost 90% of them were back, you know, at about the one year anniversary of the, of the disaster. Uh, work on PTSD kind of shows the same thing, you know, remarkably low levels of PTSD among um, Vietnamese Americans who kind of suffered the same sort of consequences as their black and white uh, um, um, neighbors. So that, in a nutshell, is, you know, at least, you know, hopefully you'll kind of um, um, consider that, you know, the, the, my conclusion that the Vietnamese did do really well, and have, again, happy to argue or, or discuss that, you know, um, after the session or some other time, but I wanted to kind of talk more about, as I'm kind of thinking about why that might be, you know, what might be some of the reasons that gave the Vietnamese a leg up in their recovery after uh, Hurricane Katrina compared to their, um, um, to, compared to their neighbors. This is the basic paradigm that disaster researchers use. The more resilience a community will have, the better the recovery. This is Fran Norris's um, you know, dimensions of, of resilience. It's kind of what I think most people here at the session would come up with. You know, uh, the resilience is going to reflect the different types of capital you know, that uh, the community will have at their disposal. The economic capital, social capital, human capital, she calls them different things, but that's basically what she's talking about. But as I kind of thought through this, you know, very carefully, um, the Vietnamese were actually disadvantaged, you know, on all of these uh, measures, or it was at best, you know, it was kind of ambiguous. Take social capital, for example, um, very tight, helpful social networks within the community, but the Vietnamese were very um, socially 
politically isolated from the powers that be, you know, um, before Katrina and then afterwards, you know, where they, when they were needed to be accessing some of these some of these resources. And so the, the 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 model doesn't doesn't fit very well. And as I've kind of started to think about, you know, well, what might it be about the Vietnamese, you know, that might have kind of distinguish them from, from their neighbors, I realized it's because they're Vietnamese, you know, you know that um, there's a set of historical experiences that they have um, lived through as individuals, but also collectively as a group, they kind of give us some, a set of perspectives on uh, recovery and other things that are very different, you know, from, from some other, um, for some other groups. And as I kind of waded, you know, further into this, it's really clear that, you know, culture is difficult to measure because it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, um, it's subjective in, in a lot of ways, but also kind of gets confused with lots of other um, 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 features of social privilege. You know, for example, um, Amy Chua, you know, for example, talks a lot about how um, people from Eastern, um, it, it, immigrants from, from Asia come over and they, do, and they do really well without kind of taking into account that they're not a random sample, you know, people, you know, from, from those seeming countries, they're, they're actually very, very special. And so that's what I mean by culture confounders. So some recent work that's been done over the last couple of decades by Michelle Lamont and others, have kind of taken a more kind of qualitative approach to, to assessing culture. And these are some of the features that they've, uh, you know, focused on. Narratives are stories that people within the community tell among themselves and then kind of leverage, you know, to kind of tell other people, um, explain to other people what they're about, what distinguishes them from, from other groups, and then also to kind of pass that along, you know, from generation to generation. Symbolic boundaries are kind of features that distinguish your Vietnamese, the Vietnamese from the rest of us, and there, there are a lot of those. And I'm not shy about your kind of being really frank about, you know, how the Vietnamese are very different you know, from other people, you know, living in, 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 in New Orleans in, in very, very, very positive, very positive ways, but they're, they're clearly engaging in this, you know, process of, of developing these symbolic boundaries. Frames are lenses or perspectives of ways that, you know, kind of given what one has experienced, it kind of gives you a new way to kind of filter, as you know, how, how you would interpret events going forward. And then there are these cultural um, um, toolkits, which are kind of repertoires that people from a particular cultural group develop that are different from other uh, from other groups. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. So, by narrative, one one story that a lot of the Vietnamese you know have told me and and others. Jason, how am I doing on time? I might stop. Watch, I forgot to start it. I'll, I'll assume I'm fine. Um, so there's this narrative of survival where you know, the Vietnamese many of the older members of the community had to move back at partition in 1954 when North Vietnam went communist, the Catholics moved to the South because they were afraid of being persecuted. Some of them you know, are, are, are still around. And they kind of had, had to kind of start all over again in South Vietnam. In April 1975, when South Vietnam collapsed, they also had to kind of move as a group, in this case, you know, to the to the US, many other countries, you know, as well, but I'm interested more in the in the Americans and kind of start all over again. So they tell these stories about how they're a group of people who survive. You know, they just kind of start over again in, in, in this new place and they tell these stories about how um, how that came to pass. A frame would be a kind of a shared perspective that they have, again, based on, on, on this you know, common history. And one that I've been thinking about is insularity. And so most of us, including me, you know, after Katrina, we kind of expected institutions to kind of step up and do what they're supposed to do. But instead, the local, state, and federal government utterly failed, you know, to kind of, um, you know, properly prepare for the disaster, res to respond appropriately afterwards. The insurance companies, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you know, kind of feature their, or, or fulfill their obligations. And I was, and most people were kind of really been out of shape by this, but the Vietnamese who I spoke, spoke with typically said, well, of course, they're not going to, to, to kind of step up and fulfill their obligation. They're kind of surprised that insurance company paid them anything at all. You know, they kind of, they, they, they kind of concluded right away that if anybody was going to help them to rebuild their community, it was going to be them. They couldn't wait for the cavalry to you know, come. And that, that's what I have in mind by um, um, insularity. Let me wrap up with a few con conclusions and takeaways. And as I do it, it's actually kind of putting these together as I was reading 
um, my uh, uh, colleagues' uh, earlier versions of their, of their presentation. So I'm going to kind of circle back to some points that they made. All right, so key takeaway that I had from David's presentation is that measurement matters, and sometimes um, you need to have subjective as well as, well as objective measures of, of recovery. Elizabeth emphasized that um, the, the long term is really different from the short term, and that you know, some of these effects are going to be, you know, not, are not going to manifest themselves until quite a ways down, down, down the road. Uh, Shigeo uh, talked a lot about how, you know, how people were faring before the disaster had implications for afterwards, and then Mary emphasized the fact, you know, kind of, or the, or this call for kind of multi-level approaches where you need to take into account, you know, context, and so. Echoing that Mary's final point, I do I agree that context is really important, and I think culture is a really important and neglected you know feature you know of that context. Um, echoing Shigeo, I think that culture is also an example of a pre-disaster characteristic that's kind of um, um, indicative or um, characteristic of a community that are going to position some very well for success, and other ones less so. I'm going to echo David and say that measuring subjective features like culture is really challenging, but it's, but it's also really important if we kind of want to kind of better understand, you know, what facilitates uh, a solid recovery. And then I'll echo Elizabeth, you know, to say that time really matters, you know, that, you know, sometimes, you know, these uh, features uh, or culture, for example, seems to matter a lot in the short run, but in the longer run, you know, just finishing an analysis led by, um, uh, Bonnie Bowie, a postdoc of ours, is kind of showing that, um, you know, that of the, the advantages, a lot of the advantages that the Vietnamese had with regard to mental health dissipated, you know, over, over a period of time. Middle, or another way to say it is the African-American advantage you know, diminished, diminished over, over time. You wouldn't know that until you kind of followed it out. Policy implications, I'm going to skip for now. I think that uh, we're going to have a lively discussion of that. Plus, um, Jason just pop, popped up, so I'm sure I'm kind of running close to being out of time. Um, they, they also a, a very grateful acknowledgement to our funders, particularly NICHD, and there's the list of papers that I promised. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. So we have a little bit under 10 minutes for questions. Um, so as questions come in, um, one of the I'll pose a question to the group if that's okay. Um, one of the questions I had was, what could you, what kind of recommendations could any of you have? for anybody out there um, watching this presentation that is contemplating um, engaging in longitudinal studies. David? So I, I think the watchword for me is serendipity, <clears throat> which is hoping that you can find just the right data set of people who have had data collected about them before the event. I've learned so much by working with Mark and Mary and contrasting what it, what it means to have those kinds of pre-event data sets. But the serendipity also extends to a serendipity of colleagues. And so for me, it was serendipitous for me that I met Shig back in 2007 and borrowed a lot from his thinking about life recovery for our socioecological model of recovery. And I feel that this serendipity keeps on getting shared. So I would urge uh, researchers who are thinking about this to, well, one, be serendipitous. I mean, <laughs> that, would be, that would be great, but also to be on the lookout for innovative ways of finding data and finding colleagues. Okay. Hi. Um, my recommendation is that um, longitudinal study costs a lot of money. And it takes so long until you come to the conclusion about the impact of particular policy. So people can't wait 10 years or 15 years until you find the result. So my recommendation is it makes sense to uh, incorporate cross-sectional surveys at the same time. And then uh, don't wait until we complete the whole series whole waves of uh, research, but every now and then, you know, keep providing uh, the cross-sectional uh, result that should correspond with the longitudinal, and that will give you another grant opportunities. 
Um, that be oh, go ahead, Mark. I'd love to hear what uh, Mary and oh, Elizabeth would say to this too. But uh, my sense is that you really want to do everything you can to make your respondents love you, or at least despise you less. You know, as, as time goes on, they get so tired of it. You know, I'll, 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 you know, over and over again, they'll tell us, we just want to move on from this. We don't understand why you kind of keep coming back, you know, and asking us, you know, the, you know these, these same questions. You know, thankfully, you know, they, most of them, you know, have done it. But it's been a real challenge. But, I, I, you know, kind of more seriously, I, I do think that having um, a, you know, really good relations in the community that you're working with, you know, beforehand, and especially early on, kind of showing that you're really interested in them can pay off um, some dividends down the down the road. Well, I agree with everything Mark said. Um, you know, in addition, I feel like in the states we would be very well served by trying to push. Um, our statistical agencies to develop partnerships with university groups and try to convert some existing baseline data in areas that sometimes get struck in order to sort of take, develop the kind of longitudinal studies that we've been all, all been talking about, but do it, you know, take advantage of that, that serendipity and, and build the infrastructure to try to, to build these panels um, from, from representative groups where we have pre-disaster events because they keep on coming and, we don't know as much as, as we need to about what the, the impacts are, both short and long-term. Mary, did you want to say something or? Just clear the deck for the next 20 years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, one of the, we have a, a, quite a, a double barrel question um, from Lori and, so, and someone else. Um, uh, Lori asked, whether or not uh, these data sets um, that you that any of you spoke of um, are available for public consumption, Shig? Yeah, um, as far as the Hyogo life recovery data is concerned, uh, we have created the uh, open database, uh, which any researcher can, um, you know, send to us, and write a letter, and then uh, we are more than happy to share. And uh, as far as the uh, GJ data set. We just completed the last wave uh, at the end of March this year. So <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, cleaning of the data. But after that, uh, we are more than happy. And this is something uh, in the uh, uh, Wednesday, oh no, Tuesday afternoon, US-Japan session talked about human-centered data set. And, you know, this would be a great opportunity, like even um, I'm interested in David data, so does he to our data. And I'm just very much interested. In our cohort data set is like, you know, in a wide data set. But what if we can add David's data and my data uh, on particular uh, common item set. Uh, even it is not exactly the same, but if we can dichotomize some of the variables, uh, values, then that would really open up uh, different dimensions. This is what we've been you know, chatting over several years. <laughs> Um, we, ha we have a, a number of questions coming in at this point. Um, so one, another question um, for the group would be, can, can you, any of you speak to the implications of using primary longitudinal data, longitudinal data versus getting a secondary data set? And what are the benefits or costs to, to those choices? Okay, Shake. Yeah. It depends on what you want uh, out of the, the data. If you need a subjective uh, evaluation of the survivors, you definitely need a surveyed uh, questionnaire result. But if you want eventually um, um, verify the impact of particular policy interventions, eventually you will need uh, um, like a housing recovery data, which are uh, vastly available. Uh, in the government. Thanks. Uh, I would I would just add that it's it's hard to find the right secondary data set that would have the level of detail and the data that we need 
Uh, when you do find something like that, maybe it's an NHANES type of data set, the problem is that you don't have enough cases in that area of the disaster impact. So you can't really pick up the level of exposure and the differential impact. So that's the challenge of trying to use secondary data for this kind of nuanced long-term individual level variability. Well, thank you. Um, as we are closing, um, I would like to thank the panel for their wonderful presentations and their wonderful remarks. Um, I'm, uh, although we have a number of questions coming in, we do have to end the session. Um, some housekeeping things. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that the welcome video uh, at the beginning of the researchers meeting will be reposted in feed loop in case anyone missed it. Um, and our next session, our next plenary session will start promptly at 4 p.m. Mountain time um, and everyone can join from feed loop. Thank you all for, for coming this afternoon. We very much appreciate it. And thank you panelists for the great work you continue to do.